shot. Shot. All right. Let's just see where we are. Shot. Good. Two, three, four, five, six. All righty. How's our blood pressure? Good. Shot. Shot. Okay, that's good. We're there. Let's get an AP just to confirm. Let me have the coker. All right, folks, for those of you joining us, I'm Dr. Duke Majan, and it is 9-1-2020. We're broadcasting live from the Surgery Center of Vieira, Duke Spine Institute, of course, with permission from our patient. Lateral, please. And today we're performing a very special surgery called a Duke Laser Disc Repair Cervical Spine. You've seen lumbars before, many of you, but cervicals are, are less common because fewer people have problems with their cervical spine. Okay, so I'm just gonna keep working and you guys can watch and listen. If you have questions, type them up and we'll do our best to answer them. Two, three, four, five, six. You agree? Dr. Arcos? You happy? Take that, please. We're going to start with the discogram. Our patient is not awake. She's asleep. She's intubated. She can't tell me what the pain response is for the discogram. We're not doing this discogram to find out her pain response shot. We're doing it because I want to inject a special dye that will stain the, the nucleus propulsus. You can see the herniation, by the way. If you look at the level we're at with the needle, you go back far enough, there's a massive herniation and the dye is outlining it. So the discogram allows me to stain the degenerated herniated disc blue so that I can see it better and take it out. But also it allows you to see the actual herniation back there, it's huge. Okay, dis uh, the discogram is done. Now we're going to place our guide wire and we're gonna use the guide wire You have another one? Yeah, but it's still got to come out the other side. We're going to use our guide wire to um, basically guide my instruments. I think we're okay. I mean, let's see if we can get this out. It shouldn't be a problem. But we're going to use this guide wire shot to guide the instruments from the outworld here where we are to the herniation safely. The key word is safely. That's what guide wires allow. They allow a safe um, movement of surgical instruments. That's our shot right there. Of surgical instruments to the body, the parts of the body that we need to operate on. Shot? All right, that's good right there. All right, we all agree, two, three, four, five, six. So I feel very confident about the level. I'm counting from C2 down. We wanna make sure we, we can clearly visualize how's our blood pressure yeah. everything good all right perfect let's just keep it below 110 systolic please all right so now the guide wires in i'm taking the needle out shot okay nice so i'm gonna i'm gonna use the guide wire now to help me get down to the herniated disc shot and i'm gonna take a lot of x-ray pictures because I want to make sure things aren't moving. Shot. Now that I have a guide wire, I know I have a safe passage past important things like the carotid artery, the jugular vein, the esophagus, the trachea. These are all structures that are normally found in the neck and that are at risk with surgery on the neck. Uh, I injected half of CC sub Q and I've got the syringe back on the field. I need a ray tech, please. So I put some numbing medicine. Is that with Epi? Yes, sir. Yeah, we, we put a very small amount, okay? And I'm gonna make the incision. I'm using a number 11 blade. Blood pressure is good, correct? So we want the blood pressure to be well controlled. 
you don't want to go too deep with the 11 blade because you don't want to cut like the external jugular or you don't want to cut anything deeper so I'm really just kind of going through the skin and I do a four millimeter incision so the whole surgery is done with a tiny tiny incision that's one of the advantages of the Duke laser disc repair over other surgeries like anterior cervical discectomy infusion or artificial disc. We have a tiny, tiny incision compared to a very large incision. The blood loss is minimal to nothing in the surgery. Currently, we've lost about three drops of blood. I want to make sure the blood pressure is good, which it is. Anyway, we can bring it down just a little bit. I don't feel we're in a dangerous area with it, but I'd like to get it down just a little bit. It would be wonderful. So now I'm going to bring my dilator down over the guide wire, okay? Again, shot, I want to make sure nothing's moving. I don't want to advance my guide wire any further because I'm right over the, spi uh, the spinal cord and nerve shot. So I'm going to be checking quite often. And I have my x-ray technician here shot. And she's running my floral machine, which is what you're looking at. You're seeing lateral views. And I'm advancing my dilator down the guide wire, making sure the guide wire itself doesn't move any further in. Shot. Now, this technique that I'm doing right here, this part, was developed in Korea, South Korea, by the Koreans. They were the first to do this. And, shot. They did their surgeries with the patients awake, which I don't do because the patient's moving around when they're awake and that's dangerous. All right. So if the patient's moving around, it creates, um, you know, another another chance of injuring something because suddenly they can move without warning and then you could end up end up injuring something. All right. So we're advancing the dilator shot. And again, I'm I want to make absolutely sure the guide wire is not moving further in as I do this. Huh? What's the problem, guys? Shot? All right. So I'm just very delicately, gently, and patiently moving through the soft tissues. I know that the guide wire is in a safe area. Shot? Any questions from our audience so far? No questions yet. All right. I don't know why, but it looks like we need to wag just a little bit on your lateral view. Um, let's just see if that improves things. Yeah, I think that's a little better. I think that's a little better. Let's just keep it there. Okay. You said no question, Sean? Correct. All right, so Sean, so I'm almost to the spine with the dilator. And the dilator just spreads the soft tissues gently, open, shot. Yep, we're just on, just about on the anterior longitudinal ligament. I can feel it right now, shot. So I can feel the front of the spine and what's called the anterior longitudinal ligament. So I know I'm as far in as I need to go for right now. I want to verify my position on an AP x-ray shot. And then let's go AP. Give me a coker. So we're going to get another view through the front to make sure that we're close to the midline. You don't have to be exactly on the midline, but you want to be, you know, within a few millimeters. Now, how do I know where the midline is? Can we straighten her head out? It's cocked a little bit to the left towards me. I would just move the donut a little bit to the right. All right, you see that tip of the dilator, then the guide wire down there in the middle? And then there's a spinous process just below. So we are really just where we want to be. Um, and we're going to move across the disc to the opposite side, which is her right side, to get that giant, giant herniation out. All right, so go back to a lateral, please. You can see the endotracheal tube is deviated right where I'm at because I'm pushing it over by, with this four, you know, three and a half millimeter tube. I'm going to advance my dilator into the disc space at this point through the anterior ligament into the disc and I'm going to move it to the back of the disc. I'm going to try to do that manually shot. If I can't get it manually, I'm going to bring my mallet. The mallet is a hammer. This is what upsets most people that watch this surgery is they see me hammering on the sp with a thing on the spine shot. But the truth is, is that the hammer 
allows the surgeon to deliver a very specific force and a very you know short um, very quick delivery of a force and hammers are used all the time in spine surgery shot so don't get upset when you see me use the hammer okay mallet I have to use it it's safer than me pushing shot shot yep perfect shot so we want to head to the back of the disc shot right where the herniation is shot beautiful so the tip of that thing is right in the herniation okay the base of the herniation and it's going across the disc to the right side so now take a look at this folks can you see this Sean this is incredible yes we can the entire surgery is done with a tiny little straw metal tube and it's called a uh, tubular dilator a tubular dilator very commonly used in surgery tubular dilator you can see it in my hands it is small and so here's one of the advantages of the surgery small 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 incision it is literally the smallest surgical incision that can be made to remove a herniated disc in the neck there's nothing smaller so I'm going to put this tubular retractor over the dilator and I'm going to run it down so that it goes through the disc and the end of this tubular dilator will be right where the herniation is. And that's what I'm going to remove is just the herniation. Sean? Okay. So why does she have right arm pain? Why does she have what we call cervical radiculopathy? Because the nerve is being crushed by a big herniated disc. It's a, a piece of the disc material that shot out through a tear, shot in the back of the disc, and now it's pressed up against her nerve root, okay? So I'm gonna go and get that herniation out, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna create what's called collateral damage. Collateral damage in surgery, or in anything really, is where you create damage in a with a something that you don't want to create damage with but it's kind of a side effect or a necessary side effect of whatever you're doing shot is that it right now all right so remember i want to advance this tubular retractor without advancing the dilator shot you gotta every time i look up and stop you need to take a shot okay how's our patient shot okay good so far so good shot and I'm going to do very small advancements here. Shot. At some point, I'm going to pull this dilator back just a little bit. Shot. Just because I don't want it to accidentally advance into the spinal canal and injure the spinal cord or the nerve. So I'm going to bring it back just a little bit. Shot. Okay. Actually, it's a little more than I want to. Why is that wire in the way? That wire is right in my way. Please don't add anything to my surgery I don't want added shot yes, sir. okay perfect now we'll keep going everything okay guys and gals mallet please thank you Luis okay that's where we are right now so for those of you watching the x-ray lateral view you can see that the tube I'm going to do the surgery through is actually right at the beginning of the disc, the front of the disc. I'm going to move it to the back. And as long as I have it sliding over the dilator, I won't biopsy the disc. Shot? Is that it? Yes. All right. Shot? So you see how the dilator moved forward? That's what you got to be careful. You don't want to move that dilator too far forward. Shot? Sean, any questions? None at the moment. All right. Many people wonder why do we broadcast live spine surgeries from the surgery center? It's really for educational purposes. Our goal is to provide the public, anyone that's interested, with an opportunity to learn about spine care. So I take questions while we're doing these surgeries and I answer them. Um, anything related to spine, whether it's surgical or not surgical, I'm happy to try to answer, Shot. Um, also, you know, doing it during surgery gives you, the viewer, a chance to actually ask, like, what are you doing and why are you doing that? And it's just, it gives you a, a view into the real world of spine surgery. Shot. 
we don't hide anything here all right at this point you can see the transition between the dilator and the tube and i think we're in really good position right now i may go just a tiny bit more shot so we do this because we want to answer questions live we do it because we want people to see that spine surgery isn't so bad and that we also do it because we want you to understand you have a choice there's different treatments for different things and you don't have to just do one treatment there's actually new treatments like the duke laser disc repair that are better than old treatments but you can't get this surgery done just anywhere you have to go to a facility or a doctor that's able to do it this is the future of spine surgery for those of you wondering herniated discs are the number one reason why we do spine surgery in the world by far and you know all these surgeons are doing these surgeries open with fusion and metal and cages and patients have trouble swallowing afterwards but the koreans developed a new technique to do a very minimally invasive endoscopic surgery i took what they taught me in terms of the approach and i modified it over the years to make it better all right i don't know what you're doing here but we need to move that out of the way so why is my surgery better well it's safer and it's more effective than anything else done in the world how do I know that? Because if you want to know the results of treatment, medical treatment, you go to the National Library of Medicine called PubMed, and you can research any treatment you want. You can find out what the success rate is, what the failure rates are, what the complication rates are, what are the complications. And the Duke Laser Disc Repair, in 15 years that we've been doing it, we've never had a complication. And there's no surgery in the world that has zero complications except this surgery to date. Does that mean we can't have a complication? No, we could, you know, but we haven't had one yet. But it just, it's a testament to the safety of this procedure. Okay, so we're going to switch the view so you all can see through the endoscope and you can see what I'm looking at. And that's the metal tube I'm working through. And that's the base of the disc herniation right there. So I'm going to take my, my um, endoscope out, and I'm going to try to grab a piece of that herniation and bring it out. And I like to send this stuff off to the pathologist because I want to make sure there's nothing funny like an infection or any kind of cancer or something, and that it's just a herniated disc, which it always is. But just to be sure, we send it to the pathologist. And they look at it under the microscope just to verify what we're seeing. Okay, uh, we're going to be at, be at 20, guys? Yes, sir. All right. So let's see. I'm, I want to yes, adjust this just a little bit. I think that's good. So you can all see the laser fiber there. It's a little bit overexposed. Let's reduce the intensity just a little bit, guys. All right. You all see the laser fiber there? It's at, uh, well, it's almost at 12 o'clock. Now it's at 12 o'clock still too bright okay i think i can there we go one more one more uh one more all right that's pretty good that's good thank you all right we got my pedal and we're ready to get started everybody good patients good all right by the way that's the end plate right over there at, you know if that's 12 o'clock where the laser fiber is about three o'clock we're starting to see some of the end plate so we're working between the bones and there's a piece of herniation right there. Now the laser, what it does is it actually does two things. It, there's a piece of herniation right there. So we're going to stop. We're going to grab it out with a grabber because it's a lot faster and safer that way. And then we're going to go back in. The laser de delivers energy to uh the herniated disc in the annular tear and by delivering energy it releases it causes a release of it causes a release of uh the scar tissue holding the herniation in place okay all herniated discs that are causing symptoms have inflammation associated look at that golden color that's calcium that's called dystrophic calcification that's from chronic inflammation this herniation she has at C5-6 
is not new. This is an old injury to the disc. And what's new is that another piece of it has shot out recently. Her symptoms started about three days ago with weakness in her arm, uh, pain from her neck down her arm, and uh, neck pain, starting to get some headaches. So she had another herniation recently, and that's why we're doing this surgery. This is, uh, has both new and old herniation. And that's typical for a herniation, by the way. Most herniated discs, they, uh, they happen, there's a piece of herniation, beautiful, you see that? That actually came out of the foramen, right where the, uh, the nerve is. So it came out, it shot out, and that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna decompress the neural foramen and we're gonna clean up the annular tear so this thing will heal on its own. There's no need to do fusion because we're not taking the whole disc out. We're not making a big incision. We're not destabilizing this area with our, sur there's another piece of herniation. Look at that, they're all coming out. And, the, and I was gonna tell you, the laser does two things. It, it zaps or vaporizes, but it does something else. This particular laser, we've selected it because it creates a pulse wave. A pulse wave is a pressure wave. And that pressure wave is, is an acoustic wave that blasts loose fragments out. So it's actually very, very helpful at not just vaporizing tissue, but it also blasts the herniations out. My hand is getting cold because our irrigation is cold. It's starting to freeze my fingers. So that's something we can talk about. Surgeons, while they're doing surgery, you know, we're, we're uncomfortable a lot of times we take that pain and suffering for our patients because we want to make them better. But it's not comfortable, you know, doing surgery. I'm far more comfortable sitting down on a couch watching TV. So surgeons sacrifice physically, emotionally, mentally for their patients so that their patients can get better. Surgery is not fun in, in a way. It's, it's actually a lot of work. It's tiring. We're, we're wearing lead during surgery you know, to protect us from radiation that we have to use. And, you know, that's dangerous stuff. Radiation can cause cancer. And so all of us have to wear lead during these surgeries just to protect ourselves from injury. Now, the patients don't get enough exposure, and we minimize the x-ray uh, exposure during surgery by, um, you know, pulsing, which means we don't give a direct beam, like a full beam of radiation. We use a pulse beam. So there's an interruption in the radiation delivery. That's safer for the patients. We also, um, we use as little fluoro as possible. You know, we try to minimize the amount of fluoro we use. Um, and I'll tell you something, higher quality x-ray machines can allow the doctor to reduce the amount of fluoro because when you have a cheap machine that's not working properly, you're gonna not see things that well. You're gonna take more pictures to try to see it better and that's gonna hurt you and the staff. When we bought our floral machines, we bought the very best in the world. They're the highest quality floral machines. They're the most expensive floral machines. They're $170,000 each. But we bought, we bought them because they're the best and they give you the best picture. So when, you, when you're using an x-ray machine to make decisions about surgery that for the patient's safety, you've gotta make sure you can see what you're doing, okay? All right, so we're inside the disc herniation, pretty much on the right side now of C5-6, and you can see the laser zapping away. There's still some herniation in there, and I've gotta you know, carefully remove it. And you can see I'm just going back and forth with the laser, zapping away at the herniation. Now, a lot of people think the herniation is one piece, but it's not. It's actually multiple pieces. And you can already see earlier some of those pieces coming out. So my job is to get out. There's another piece right there. My job is to get out as many as I can. And ultimately, I want the patient's uh, nerve to be unpinched. Do I have to get 100% out? No. 
If you're going for 100 every time, you're going to end up hurting the patient sometime. Um, because, you know, you want to get you want to get the disc herniation to a point where it's not causing symptoms. But everybody has disc herniations. And we don't get rid of all disc herniations. We only get rid of the ones that are causing symptoms. So the same applies for surgery. When you're doing surgery on somebody with a disc herniation, you want to take out what you need to to, um, to relieve their symptoms. But if you try to gild the lily, you're going to end up causing damage to the patient or harming the patient if you go too far, okay? So it's really, that's where the art, the art of medicine comes in. Knowing what your limitations are, where you should stop, and not hurting the patient in the process. All right. We have a couple questions. Okay, go ahead. One of our viewers is wondering, have you ever thought to teach military doctors this technology? So one of our viewers asked, have you ever thought to teach military doctors this technology? The answer is yes. Of course, I would love to teach the military doctors this technology. As a matter of fact, for about uh, six months, the military agreed to let us do these surgeries, and they worked. Um, unfortunately, the military is very complicated, and I don't have connections in the military, uh, even though my father was a, was a captain in the Army as a doctor uh, back in the 60s and 70s, early 70s. I was born in Germany on a military base, U.S. base. Um, but the fact of the matter is to get the military to agree to do this type of surgery, you have to have uh, military lobbyists. And military lobbyists, they want a lot of money that I don't have um, to go to Congress and lobby for you. Um, so. I think it's a great investment of money that I don't have. If there's somebody that wants to partner with me and help me you know, get the military interested because this is a much better surgery than what the military hospitals are offering. They don't have a cure for back pain. And the cures that they have, if they do have a cure, is a fusion. And you know, once you fuse a soldier, their neck or their back, you know, they're never gonna be the same and fusions that they're doing 50 50 will help the other 50 percent won't whereas a hundred percent of these surgeries help we've never had a patient have this surgery that it didn't work for and help and there's no metal there's no fusion they don't lose any of that natural movement so to answer your question i would love to work with the military i just don't have the bandwidth i don't have the connections and ultimately, I don't have the money to, uh, to hire a military consultant. All right, I've got about 10 minutes max left. So on the anesthesia, so if you want to start winding her down a little bit, I definitely don't need any more. Oh, look at that herniation. Wow. That thing just popped out of the foramen. So what I've done is I've redirected more lateral to get more lateral in the foramen because I can still see there's a little bit of fragments in there uh, on the nerve root, and that thing just shot out. Now, I don't know if I grabbed it. I don't really see it, so I may have to go back in and find it. What other questions do you have? Sean, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, there it is, so it's too big. Give me just big. a moment. Uh, I'm going to try to loosen it up some more and see if I can get it out. But that's a huge piece of herniation. Uh, I'm going to try to grab it out again. Okay, we have another question. Sure. One of our viewers is wondering, what makes ALIF so much unsafer than TLIF or XLIF? All right, so one of our viewers is asking, what makes an ALIF so much unsafer than an X lift or T lift? There it is. That's a great question. And the answer is the approach. So what is an approach? The approach is the way the surgeon gets to the body part they have to fix. In this case, with an A lift, T lift, X lift, it's the spine, okay? So with an A lift, by the way, that's the dura down there that we're looking at. With an A-lift, the approach is through the belly. 
and going through the belly is always more dangerous than um, going through the back. So a lift surgery is just inherently more dangerous because you've got intestines, you've got blood vessels, you've got all kinds of things going on in the belly. There's another piece. And if you go through the belly to get to the spine, you got to basically go past all these things or you have to move them over. And moving things over like that is just dangerous. So a lift and it's not just my opinion folks this has been proven a lift is far more risky and dangerous than t lift and p lift or x lift x lift is coming from the side the side of the spine x lift is more dangerous than t lift um, because x lift requires the doctor, the surgeon, to basically um, go past the, the, some nerves that run in the psoas muscle. And that's where the problem is. Frequently, those nerves get injured during surgery. And that's not something you want, okay? It's definitely not something you want. All right, great question. So I've got to figure out where do I stop, right? Where do we stop? We want to make sure we get out as much as we need to so we don't have to come back. But at the same time, we don't want to do too much to where... Look at that. That's pretty cool, huh? That little bit I want to wipe off. It's a little piece of material just sitting on my laser. All right. So. I don't think we're done yet. This is a pretty good size herniation. I think we're close. You can see all the scarring going on over here. Hold on, hold on. This is all scar tissue from inflammation. This is towards the middle of the disc right here. We're going the opposite way. And once again, we want to remove only the stuff compressing, right? Because if we start removing everything, we're going to have a problem. We're going to end up overdoing it. And we don't want to overdo it. And I'm basically what I'm doing right now, I'm trying to use the pulse of the laser to free up herniation. Yeah, we need a switch. We need a switch because I'm not done. Okay, so let's keep going. All right, so what do we got here? You see the blue dye, folks, the blue color? It's all, by the way, for those of you wondering, that white thing on the left of my laser, that's the end plate of C6, and on the right is the end plate of C5. And this is a bone spur right here. Now, the bone spur isn't what is causing acutely her symptoms, but definitely contributing to the narrowing and stenosis. So we want to try to, while I'm here, as long as it's safe to remove, I'm going to remove that bone spur. Because that's going to help the patient have longer relief, longer lasting relief. All right. So far, everything's going okay. You can see how bloodless the surgery is. I just want to make sure we get all these pieces of herniation. So I'm pulling my tube back a little bit and looking for any more herniations, fragments in the back. 
So we may clear everything out, but we don't want another herniation to go back into that area. So I'm just kind of looking around and cleaning up here. I do want to get a little bit more lateral. That's what I'm trying to do right now. Get a little more lateral just to make sure I have the, everything out of the foramen that's sitting on the nerve. This is all herniation right there. Uh, pretty incredible, you know. A lot of this stuff is scarred in because it happened a while ago. All right, I think we're just about done. I've done everything I can. I'm going to look back a little more, just one more time, one more attack. And this is part of the herniation, but it's not the part sitting on the nerve. It's kind of like what we call the base. If you think about the part sitting on the nerve as being, uh, well, that's a big herniation, by the way, really big. If you think about the part that's pushed up against the nerve as being the tip of the iceberg, this is kind of the base. So we want to try to take as much of it out as we can, because our goal is to take the whole iceberg down so it doesn't push on the nerve anymore. You can see the foramen, the nerve root is in there. And again, the herniation comes up to right here. This is all nerve root down there underneath that. Now the question is how much of that do we have to peel off, right? And that's, that's the art. That's what I have to figure out while I'm in here. This stuff is old, has been here. I'm gonna take one more pass and then I'm gonna call it a day on this one. This is the annular tear we talked about. Good. 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 That's a piece of herniation more towards the middle. I want to make sure we get all this stuff out. A lot of it we can just float out. These are not, this is not the herniation sitting on the nerve root. This is more towards the middle of the disc. And if I clean this up now, chances are she won't have problems here later. So remember my goal is to here with the surgery and it may seem counterintuitive, but my goal is to not just fix what's causing a problem today, but also to prevent something from happening down the road. Okay. What I mean by that is if I can get this disc to heal properly now, she won't be back for another surgery. And how do you get the disc to heal properly? Well, you get rid of as much of the scar tissue and clean up the annulus as much as possible. Questions from our audience, Sean? No other questions currently. No questions? Correct. Very good. 
All right. Oh, by the way, what's limiting me to get further lateral is the uh, uncinate process. For all you spine buffs out there. All right, that should do it. We're done. We're done. All right, I'm going to show you the whole surgery was done with a tiny little incision on her neck. Now, could this patient have had a fusion? Absolutely. Any other surgeon would have done an anterior cervical discectomy infusion or an artificial disc. Those are two very common typical surgeries. Another option would be to go to the back of the neck and do a, a laminectomy, okay? A laminectomy for amenotomy. Of all those surgeries, the least invasive is the one you just watched. There's no bone removed like you do in a laminectomy, so it keeps the spine stable. And the nerve is getting pinched from the front. That's where the disc is, it's in the front. So any surgery that goes through the front has a higher chance of success. So that's your Duke laser disc repair, your ACDF, and your artificial disc. Artificial discs, in my opinion, are not as successful because it's very hard to get to the back of the disc to get that herniation out well and still place an artificial disc. A fusion stops the movement. So if the disc is still left there, a piece of it hitting the nerve, there won't be any symptoms because you've gotten rid of most of the disc and you fuse the segment so there's no movement, so there's no banging on the nerve anymore. And then finally, the Duke laser disc repair, what you just watched, we don't take any of the normal disc out. We just take the piece in the back that's pushing on the nerve out, which is what we did. So um, there's no need to fuse or put an artificial disc in because we haven't removed the disc. Okay. We just removed the herniation. So let's take a look. There's the incision. Can you all see that, Sean? Yes, we can. Tiny. Four millimeters. All right, put some pressure. We'll put pressure if there's any venous bleeding. There's no bleeding really, but we just do it as a precaution. And we'll leave pressure for a few minutes. Now, how much blood did we lose? We lost like two drops, almost nothing. So the laser surgery, the Duke laser disc repair that you watched, fixes things in the spine without, pretty much without blood loss. So if you don't want to be losing blood during surgery, you're worried about transfusions with other types of surgery like ACDF or artificial disc, you don't need to worry with the la Duke laser disc repair. All right, go ahead and type your questions up and I'll be there to answer them in a few minutes. Come on. I feel, I really feel great. I mean, well, before the operation, I can only walk up maybe 100 feet, and I had to go back in the house. Now I can walk pretty much two miles every morning. In fact, they marvel at me at the gym that I'm able to do what I can do there. I'm kind of an inspiration for a lot of people at the gym. <laughs>my name is Greg Spadaro. Um, this is my father, Jack Spadaro. We are from Connecticut. We moved down here. For me, it's been about 20 years. I think my father's been down here a good 24 years now. And uh, we've been two individuals that have kind of suffered with back pain and problems for a good portion of our lives. My situation started back in 1964. I had uh, an injury bowling in uh, it was not a, not a serious injury, but someone at the time recommended me going to a chiropractor at the time. And uh, I went to this guy and I went to see him and he uh, ended up uh, rupturing my disc. It was the first operation. It was a neurosurgeon in Hartford, Connecticut named Dr. Scoville. And he did an excellent job. And for years after that, I was fine until I got here in Florida again and my back problem started again. But uh, we went up to uh, Tampa. I had 
several uh, laser surgeries done, which actually only aggravated my situation. And then locally we had a neurosurgeon in here that uh, became well, well uh, respected as, as, as an excellent surgeon, and he operated on me twice. And my situation only got worse. Uh, I, had, I was bent over with the pain in my left side for a long time, almost two years. And then I heard my son telling me about uh, Dr. Duke. And uh, so I ended up going up to see Dr. Duke and explained my situation to him, how I, I was uh, in such pain and such. And he, he took an x-ray and evaluated me and he showed me on the x-ray how my operation actually had come apart. The diffusion that they, they did locally here was, had come apart and it would be, the nerve was being impinged on by the, uh, the bone. So um, he recommended to me that, he, that we needed to be operated on and he told me what he was going to do and how he was going to do it and that, uh, that he felt he could help me. He was so convincing. All right, everyone, thank you for joining us for the post-op Q&A. We've got Dr. Duke in the room with us, ready to answer some of your burning questions about neck and back pain. Our first question comes from a viewer on Facebook who is wondering, will an epidural injection help with an annular tear? Okay. First of all, thank you all for joining us today. Um, yeah, that was uh, just before I answer the questions, I'll just say, uh, if you watch the surgery we just did, it was a live stream over the internet around the world um, of a Duke laser disc repair. This is a novel type of surgery. We published the technique back in 2012, that was eight years ago, and then we published our first paper on the results uh, of the surgery and, and, the, and the patients and how they do after the, you know, from the surgery, the treatment with the surgery. Uh, with respect to neck pain, headaches, arm symptoms. Those arm symptoms, we call them radicular symptoms. Um, so when you get a herniated disc in the neck, in your cervical spine, it can push on the nerve going in your arm and cause arm symptoms like numbness in your hand, tingling in your finger, weakness in your arm, or even pain shooting down the arm, um, kind of like a sciatica but of the arm. And so those are called radicular symptoms because they're coming from the nerve root. So Radicular means radical, it's related to r radical. Radicular is radical, radical is root. Um, so I didn't make this stuff up. This is just common t medical terminology. So um, radicular symptoms in the neck from a herniated disc are caused by two different things. Either pressure on the nerve, as was the case for the patient today, or irritation of the nerve through inflammation, which is m far more common in my experience of 22 years of doing neurosurgery of the spine, far more common for people to have an irritation of the nerve root from a small herniation that isn't really pressuring the nerve. It's just kind of up against it and getting the inflammatory chemicals from the annular tear where the inflammation is occurring getting onto the nerve root and causing radicular symptoms. So fixing the herniation on the side of the symptoms is very important if you want to get rid of somebody's radicular symptoms or arm symptoms. Now, the center of the tear, the center of the disc, if the tear is in the center of the disc, you can get headaches because the inflammation from the annular tear leaks onto the dura, and the dura wraps up around the brain. So irritation of the dura in the neck uh, from a cervical disc herniation definitely can cause headaches. We call those headaches cervicogenic headaches. So, and then of course you have pain in the neck, which is your disc pain from the inflammation in the annulus. So you have neck pain, you get headaches that come from the neck, and then you get arm symptoms. And then there's one more thing called myelopathy, which we're not going to talk about today, which is spinal cord dysfunction from a herniated disc. Anyway, a paper we published in 2013 called Cervical Duke Laser Disc Repair, and I don't remember the exact title, but essentially we reported on the relief that patients got from the Duke Laser Disc Repair with respect to neck pain, headaches, 
and arm symptoms from herniated discs in the neck. And we had um, around 92% elimination of the arm symptoms, around, I believe it was around 85 or 90% elimination of the neck pain, and, and I'm pretty sure it was close to 92% elimination of headaches. Anyway, um, that was from our earlier surgeries. Since then, we've consistently seen anywhere from 95 to 100% relief of symptoms over the last probably five years. And so the results of the Duke laser disc repair endoscopic surgery on the neck with respect to neck pain, headaches, and arm symptoms have only gotten better in the last five years to where we're at probably around 95% elimination of preoperative pain, which is remarkable because there's no other surgery in the world that comes close, not even fusion, not even artificial disc, nothing, not even close. And then, of course, zero complications to date make this the safest surgery on the spine in the world by far because there's no other surgery that has zero complications. So um, answering the first que or the last question we just got, which is, will an epidural help with the symptoms of the annular tear? The answer is it can definitely help with the inflammation in the annular tear. As a matter of fact, that is how epidurals work. Most doctors don't know that. Even doctors that do epidurals don't know that. The epidural is basically an injection of a steroid. Steroids are powerful, powerful anti-inflammatory medications. It's in the form of a liquid, and so it kind of oozes around once you inject it around the nerve and the spinal cord and the disc. And the mechanism of action is poorly understood elsewhere, but we at Duke Spine understand how it works. The medicine injected in epidural, the steroid, basically gets on the nerve root and the disc where the uh, tear is, and it reduces the inflammation right there, right where that tear, where, right where the annular tear is and right where the nerve is being irritated. Now, sometimes the scar tissue or the, uh, the, ner or the space around the nerve root is so tiny or tight that the medicine can't get in there. So you don't really get a good effect of the epidural. But when an epidural does work, it works by reducing the inflammation from the annular tear. So there's your answer. I hope that, that you know, I hope that makes sense. Here's Sean with our next question. All right, our next viewer is wondering, can surgery help with foramenal narrowing? I have pain and numbness in my legs and back pain. I get shots four times per year to relieve it. Well, hi there. Um, thank you for asking, and we appreciate all the questions we get. So we have a question from one of our viewers asking, will surgery help with foramenal narrowing? I have pain and numbness in my legs and back. Back pain, I've gotten shots four times a year. So... Let me just answer this for you. Foramenal narrowing is narrowing of the foramen. And narrowing of the foramen means that whatever is in the foramen already that's supposed to be there, it has less room. And the thing we're concerned about in the foramen is the nerve root, the nerve that's coming out of the foramen and going down your leg. And anytime you get foramenal narrowing, what you're potentially going to have as a symptom is pain down your leg, numbness in your leg, weakness in your leg, or tingling. Pain, numbness, weakness, tingling. Those are the four symptoms that people get from a nerve problem in the foramen, okay? So can surgery um, help with foramenal narrowing? Yes. What's the best surgery for foramenal narrowing? The one you just watched today, Duke Laser Disc Repair. It is the only surgery in the world where the surgery is done in the foramen, okay? Every other back surgery done, it's done in the spinal canal. And the surgeon has to take bone away from the spinal canal and then move laterally or to the side towards the foramen. So the only way they can get to the foramen is by removing the normal bone in your spine that you don't want removed. You want it staying there. Okay, to get to the foramen, every other spine surgeon goes through your spine. They make a cut in the middle of your back or just off to the side. They take the muscle off your spine, and then they drill holes in the bones of your spine in the back just to get to the foramen. You don't want that done. That is the 
old-fashioned way of doing things. It's what 99% of spine surgeons do these days. But what the, the reason they do that is they don't have the skills, they don't have the knowledge, they've never been trained on what you saw today, transferaminal surgery. There's only a couple of us in the world that know how to do it. And the reason for that is, is that it's not taught where we train. There are um, about 150 to 200 spine training programs in the United States. And in those programs, nobody teaches endoscopic surgery except for one program. I'm pretty sure it's New Mexico, and I don't even know if they're still teaching it. But um, every other, and nobody wants to go to New Mexico, by the way. If you're a really good doctor and you have good grades and you want to be a neurosurgeon, you wouldn't go to New Mexico. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'm just being honest with you. You wouldn't go there to learn neurosurgery. Uh, you go to one of the top neurosurgery programs like I did, um, you know, at University of Florida in Gainesville or USC in Los Angeles, UCLA, et cetera, Harvard. So long story short, the training isn't there. So how can you expect the surgeons to know how to do transferaminal surgery like you saw today? The answer is you can't because they're not being taught how to do it. So how did I learn? I had to actually go and learn from the Koreans, from a German surgeon, from Dr. Young, basically a variety of surgeons that were doing the surgery, mostly overseas. And I learned what they did and how they did it, and then I took all of their techniques and I combined it into a new surgery called the Duke Laser Disc Repair. What's similar is the approach, the incision, the instruments. However, what I do when I get to the disc is different. They take herniations out, I take herniations out, but most importantly, what I do is I debride the annular tear. And it's a laser debridement of the annular tear that cures the back pain and ultimately will cure the leg symptoms or arm symptoms. So what's the best treatment for foraminal narrowing? Transforaminal Duke laser disc repair surgery. Can other surgeries fix it? Yes. But the collateral damage that's going to be done in the process is going to be devastating to your spine and you shouldn't do it. All right, our next question comes from another Facebook user who's wondering, can scar tissue develop eight months after DLDR, and how long does it take for a disc to fully heal after DLDR? Great question. So can scar tissue develop eight months after a DLDR, and how long does it take for the disc to fully heal after DLDR? So scar tissue is how your body heals everything. It heals with scar tissue. There is an exception, and that is a couple of exceptions. One, um, your brain, when you have an injury to your brain like a stroke, you don't develop scar tissue. Uh, it's, it's just a little bit of scar tissue, but the rest doesn't. And then bone, if your bone gets broken and it reheals, it heals with bone. So pretty much, Everything else, except for the lens and the eye, which makes cataracts, everything else in your body heals with scar tissue, okay? Whether it's your skin, your muscle, your disc. Now, it just turns out that the disc itself, the outer part of the disc called the annulus fibrosus, is scar tissue. It's the same thing as scar tissue. It's called collagen. And collagen makes up scar tissue. There's a little bit of elastin as well, but mostly collagen and there's different kinds of collagen and basically your disc the outer half of your disc the rind that goes around the jelly is collagen so the question says can scar tissue develop after a duke laser disc repair yes as a matter of fact you want it to that's what holds the herniation of the the jelly in the center from coming back out and making a new herniation which will then cause problems for you and then it says, how long does it take for the disc to fully heal after the Duke laser disc repair? It takes one year for the disc to fully heal. One year. And before that year is up, if you re-injure the disc, you can get another herniation. So what's the chance of getting another herniation with the Duke laser disc repair? It's 1%. That's one out of 100 people will get another herniation. And Generally, it's, you know, patients who have done too much. They've done something they're not supposed to do after surgery, whether they're bending over, picking something up, they're bending at the waist, or they're lifting something heavy and twisting. 
those kind of things have to be avoided. That's why we put everybody in a back brace and tell them to wear it for six weeks. We don't want people lifting and bending and twisting at the waist after surgery and until that disc is healing more. Sean says that was our last question. So the next surgery we're doing is another very special surgery. It is a thoracic disc herniation. For the first 14 years that I did the Duke laser disc repair, I would not do thoracic disc herniations for two reasons. Number one, they were very rare to be symptomatic, so people rarely ever needed surgery on the thoracic disc. And number two, they're more dangerous and risky than a cervical or lumbar disc herniation. But I started doing thoracic disc herniations in the last 12 months because I've had a couple of patients that had no other option to get better except for the laser surgery. And I told them that I would try it, but at the first sign that I was concerned that there would be a complication, I would stop the surgery. Well, fortunately, I was able to do the surgeries without complication, and the patients did amazingly well with all their pain gone from their thoracic spine once I did the laser surgery on their thoracic herniation. And to date, I've done four patients with thoracic disc herniations. Today will be the fifth. So today's, today is a very unique day at Duke Spine Institute because we're doing four Duke laser disc repair patient surgeries, and three of them include a cervical Duke laser disc repair, a lumbar Duke laser disc repair, and a thoracic Duke laser disc repair. So we're actually doing all three parts of the spine today. It's a very unique day, very different than normal. And um, yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting and, and good day. So if you're watching, you'll be able to see all three types of Duke laser disc repair done. All right, well, that was our last question. I hope you stick around for the next one, which will start in about 25, 30 minutes. It's a single level thoracic disc herniation, T9, T10. And, um, yep, and just like the other ones, if I feel that it's not safe to proceed, I'm going to abort the procedure. All right, hope you enjoyed the cervical, and we'll see how our patient's doing. I expect her to do well. Uh, I was able to get out most of the herniation, probably about 80% to 85% of it, and we're going to go see if that was enough for her, okay? I expect it will be, but we'll see.